All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Reed. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at MondoWise. We hope you all are staying safe and healthy, and we appreciate you joining us today for this program. Uh, today, we're partnering with the organizations Al Haq and Adala to bring you an update on the situation for Palestinians living under Israeli occupation. For those of you tuning in on Zoom, after the program ends, you'll be taken to a donation page, and a portion of the funds raised there will go to both organizations to help support their important work. We'll also be answering questions from the audience later in the program. Again, if you're joining us through Zoom, please post your questions in the chat window. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you can post a question in the comments. With that, I'm gonna turn things over to Yumna Patel, our Palestine correspondent based in Bethlehem. Thank you, Dave. Um, throughout the duration of the coronavirus pandemic, which reached the occupied Palestinian territory in early March, hundreds of instances of Israeli violations of Palestinian rights have been reported. Settler attacks, home demolitions, and arrests have continued unhindered in the West Bank, while Palestinian communities in Israel and East Jerusalem have been severely neglected in Israel's fight against the virus. We are joined today by two Palestinian human rights advocates to shed light on the violations that have been taking place in Israel and Palestine during the pandemic, and to offer us a unique insight into their work during this exceptional time. I'd like to welcome Suha Jarrar, a researcher and advocacy officer at Al Haq, a human rights organization based in Ramallah, and Zuhair Assad, the international advocacy coordinator for Adalla, the legal center for Arab minority rights in Israel. I wanna start off with Suha Jarrar, who's joining us from the West Bank city of Ramallah and is going to give us a look into what life under occupation has been like since the pandemic began. So Suha, I'll pass it off to you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> um, again, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you to the organizers for holding such an important event to shed light on the fact that even in the face of a global pandemic and as COVID-19 continues uh, to spread across the globe, the Israeli occupying forces continue to carry out systematic and unlawful human rights violations against Palestinians. Uh, across the occupied Palestinian territory, including the Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem. In, the, uh, in fact, for Palestinians, uh, COVID-19 has further unveiled um, uh, Israel's systematic uh, racial discrimination and domination over uh, the occupied Palestinian population. Um, I just want to start a little bit by saying just a short introduction about al we're a Palestinian human rights organization based in Ramallah in the occupied territory. Uh, we were established in 1979 and have been working on uh, documenting and reporting on human rights violations against Palestinians uh, across the occupied territory including the Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem. And the backbone of our work um, is our monitoring and documentation department, which consists of field researchers across the occupied territory. Uh, the legal research and advocacy department, which I am a part of, focuses on documenting um, and reporting on violations committed by the Israeli occupying forces in particular. Uh, we monitor and document a wide range of violations, including uh, killings, uh, curfews, demolitions, uh, destruction of property, restrictions on movement, um, arbitrary detention, settler violence, and other violations. And within the context of the COVID-19 outbreak, and as the title of this event suggests, uh, the occupation and its crimes in the occupied territory uh, are alive and well, and the work of the organization has not stopped and our field workers um, continue to document and produce daily reports, even with the limitations that arise as a result of the lockdowns and the state of emergency that is currently in place. Uh, and as mentioned, it's important to recall that as COVID-19 continues to spread across the occupied territory, 
Israel's apartheid regime and system of racial discrimination has actually become more apparent uh, than ever. Uh, I'll begin by giving a bit of context on the situation relevant to, health, to the healthcare system and how the Israeli occupation and Israel's practices are in fact preventing Palestinians' ability to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 uh, across the territory. In the Gaza Strip, we have uh, two field researchers who continue to document violations even under the current state of emergency. These include attacks on civilians, uh, including fishermen, uh, farmers, children, amongst other civilians. Currently, there are about 2 million Palestinians who have been living under almost um, 13 years of illegal Israeli closure. This closure has already, in a detrimental way, uh, undermined all aspects of life in the Strip and uh, has pushed the healthcare system there to the verge of collapse uh, as a result of Israel's uh, policy of de-development in the Gaza Strip. So even before the pandemic, um, the healthcare system in Gaza already faced severe shortages of medicines, medical supplies and equipment, obviously depriving Palestinians of their right to health and in the most serious cases, their right to life. Uh, it's important, important to also mention that these conditions are compounded by other vulnerabilities um, that uh, the population in the Gaza Strip face. Uh, they're also compounded by a chronic electricity crisis and the contamination of almost 97% of Gaza's water supply. This condition in itself has prevented Palestinians from effectively preventing the spread of COVID-19. Currently, the Gaza, the Gaza Strip has 17 confirmed cases of COVID-19, uh, but only 87 ventilators for 2 million Palestinians are available, of which 80 to 90% are already in use. Um, similarly, the healthcare system in the West Bank is also compromised and the ability of the Palestinian Authority in terms of testing, uh, preventing the spread and even offering treatment to those who test positive to the coronavirus is also severely limited. Uh, the West Bank, for example, only has 256 ventilators for some 3 million Palestinians uh, residing there. Um, at the time when everybody is uh, encouraged uh, to stay at home and to practice social distancing to limit the spread of the coronavirus, Palestinians' efforts to prevent and mitigate uh, the effects of COVID-19 are actually being undermined systematically. Human rights violations have continued, including Israel's demolition of Palestinian homes on both sides of the Green Line, uh, even though Israel has declared that it will freeze these demolition practices. Um, due to uh, limitations, uh, oh, sorry, freeze them under the current state of emergency, that is. Due to limitations on monitoring and documentation at the moment, uh, we do not have confirmed numbers of demolitions since the start of the state of emergency, but we have documented demolition cases, including home demolitions and demolitions of water structures. Uh, but we are witnessing an increased uh, increasing trend in um, the issuing of demolition orders by the Israeli civil administration, particularly in Area C for different types of structures. Confiscation of um, property has also uh, continued during the state of emergency. For example, on uh, 26 March, the Israeli occupying forces confiscated poles, sheeting, and other materials that were to be used for um, uh, two field clinics, uh, four emergency housing units, and two mosques in a town in the northern part of the Jordan Valley in occupied West Bank. Um, in addition, there were reports of Palestinian volunteers involved in local initiatives to disinfect schools and institutions uh, uh, or distribute foodstuffs in underserviced areas of, the, uh, of Jerusalem, uh, in particular in the Old City, have faced arrests by the Israeli occupying forces uh, with also aid materials uh, confiscated. Other violations that we regularly monitor and document are those of settler attacks and settler violence. Uh, we are actually witnessing very noticeable spike in settler attacks amid COVID outbreak. Uh, and we have documented cases involving attacks on farmers, attacks on herders, on children, and on uh, the elderly, and include, including um, 
increased attacks of settlers illegally, uh, of course, residing in settlements, specifically its hard settlement, which is known for being home to some of the most extremely violent settlers residing illegally in the West Bank. This has been a very noticeable trend since the beginning of the COVID uh, outbreak that has increased during uh, this pandemic. In fact, uh, at the beginning of the month, uh, the beginning of April, the UN reported that settler violence has increased by 78% since the start uh, of COVID-19 outbreak. On the situation of workers, um, on 14 April, Al-Haq, along with a number of human rights organizations, sent a joint appeal to the UN Special Procedures asking for urgent intervention needed to uphold the rights and dignity of Palestinian workers employed in Israel during the COVID-19 pandemic. In the appeal, which uh, can be found on our website, we highlight the current dire situation of Palestinian workers during the ongoing pandemic. It's important here to mention that Palestinian workers have long been subjected to Israel's policies of racial discrimination and apartheid. And Israel has historically, systematically undermined their right to health, to work, to adequate standard of living amongst uh, other rights as well. To date, Israel has failed to test and ensure the treatment of Palestinian uh, workers working in Israel prior to their return to the occupied territory. Israel has also obstructed measures taken by the Palestinian Authority to contain and mitigate the effects of COVID-19 and has failed to take measures to uh, curb the spread of, of the pandemic in the occupied territory. On um, on the 21st of March, actually, the Israeli government announced restrictions on movement uh, of people between the occupied Palestinian territory and Israel, even those who um, um, have permits. Even though Israel has used security as a pretext for years to deny Palestinians work permits, Israel actually allowed 60,000 Palestinian workers employed in Israel to temporarily reside there during the public health emergency. These include Palestinians working in what Israel considers to be essential sectors, including construction, healthcare, and other sectors. So their labor is now being prioritized over their health and safety during the pandemic. There have been reported cases of workers who have shown symptoms of COVID-19 being left and thrown at checkpoints until Palestinian ambulances came uh, but And this happened without prior coordination with the Palestinian Authority, so there was no guarantee that they were going to be um, tended to. Apologies. For workers who have stayed in Israel, uh, even though their employers are mandated, this was declared as well, to arrange their accommodation and to ensure proper uh, sanitation and food, there have been reports of dire housing conditions uh, they, uh, that they face while working in Israel at this, um, uh, at this moment, including sleeping at construction sites or in greenhouses. Uh, and now with more workers returning to the occupied territory or at the beginning of the month, at least before the Jewish holidays, and as the Palestinian Authority actually called for workers to return, um, uh, staff members of Palestinian emergency units that were deployed at different checkpoints um, to uh, do preliminary testing or monitoring began to receive the returning workers um, uh, as a form of also kind of containment measure. But Israel at the same time began actually opening new access points such as agricultural gates located south of Qalqilia governorate, uh, allowing Palestinian workers to enter the occupied West Bank without informing the Palestinian Authority. Opening these access points, including clipping a passage through the barbed fence by the annexation wall, is also only testament to the void security uh, pretext that Israel continues to suggest, particularly in relation to the illegal construction of the annexation wall. Uh, in the West Bank, the majority of confirmed, and this is really important, the majority of confirmed cases are of Palestinian workers employed in Israel or in illegal Israeli settlements, in addition to those who came into contact with them. 
Uh, in fact, um, on 25th of March, Pal uh, a Palestinian woman in her 60s became the first to die from COVID-19 in the West Bank. She contracted the virus from her son who works in Israel. And on April 10, a uh, 55-year-old Palestinian worker became the second death in the occupied Palestinian territory. As of mid-April, the Palestinian Health uh, Ministry has found that roughly a third of those who contracted the, the virus in the West Bank were Palestinian workers, uh, and about 40% of West Bank cases contracted uh, the virus after they came into contact with Palestinian workers working in Israel. On the situation of prisoners, uh, Palestinian political prisoners uh, face the additional threat, of course, of a coronavirus outbreak in Israeli prisons and detention centers. Uh, the Israeli occupying forces have taken no steps to release Palestinian prisoners or to adequately prevent COVID outbreak in prisons, which are overcrowded. Instead, mass detentions and arrests, which um, is a systematic uh, policy that Israel carries out against Palestinians anyway, have continued during the pandemic. And as of mid-April, according to the Mir statistics, um, there are about 5,000 Palestinian political prisoners, including uh, more than 400 administrative detainees, uh, almost 40 plus women detainees, seven parliamentarians, and over 180 child detainees. Palestinian prisoners are particularly vulnerable to the coronavirus um, because they already endured dire detention conditions, including systematic torture and ill-treatment, medical negligence, negligence, overcrowding, lack of proper ventilation, and access to uh, sanitary products, including disinfectants. Um, and in certain cases, complete bans of family visits, which are now being suspended entirely since the state of emergency. Now, hundreds of, of detainees of detained um, uh, suffer from uh, chronic diseases and go that go untreated despite the pandemic. Israel uh, continues to routine, routinely arrest Palestinians from their homes uh, in the West Bank um, uh, and East Jerusalem and immediately place them under quarantine. Uh, the last point I want to, to highlight um, is that the Palestinian, um, Palestinian prisoners are also completely isolated from the rest of the world right now. Israel continues to deny Palestinians the right to contact their families and to contact their legal representatives because all visits are suspended currently and it continues to refuse to install, install landlines for a com uh, communication with families and lawyers. And this situation is pr particularly dire for women uh, because they have absolutely no means of communication and earlier this month, Israel announced a new emergency regulation to allow Palestinian women to contact their families. Most have contacted their families, but two days ago, the Israeli intelligence agency violated the state of emergency procedure by prohibiting three women prisoners from contacting families. My mother actually being one of them because she is currently detained. Um, so I have kind of a personal perspective on that. I'm going to stop here. I know I went over time. I'm sorry about that, but I'm um, happy to answer any follow-up questions. Thank you, Soha, so much. That was really insightful. And we're going to um, ask both you and Sohair questions at the end of Sohair's report. Um, so now I'd like to turn it over to Sohair, who is based in Haifa, and she's going to give us a look into what life has been like um, living in in Israel and also for Palestinians, specifically in East Jerusalem under the, the COVID pandemic. Thank you, Yumna, and thank you for the invitation um, for, for me and for Adala to be part uh, of this webinar. Um, I know we're limited in time and the subject is really huge, so I'm going to try to be focused and I invite everyone, if you have any other questions, to ask uh, to ask me or Suha uh, later. Um, first, um, like before I start giving a report, a detailed report in the situation of Palestinians, uh, citizens of Israel and in East Jerusalem, and I'm also going to touch on some of the issues that also Suha touched on, on them, uh, because as Adala, we don't only work on Palestinian citizens of Israel, but also work uh, and challenge legally the rights of all Palestinians, and I think this special position give us an insight onto the Israeli legal system and the way um, the scene is intensified uh, during the coronavirus. Um, so I guess I'll start by saying that 
all human rights organization and human rights defenders um, are witnessing at this period basically what we dealt with for years and from Adala we dealt with many of these issues for 20 years we're seeing that the cases that the, the structural issues of injustice and inequality that are faced by Palestinians everywhere not only inside Israel are now um, basically intensified in this scene of the coronavirus. And if we used to work on that legally over the years, now we're very, yani we're dealing with a huge number of cases in a very short period because um, the emerg in, in, in the emergency, we have to address the underlying conditions that Palestinians live under for years. Um, and I think this issue is not unique for Palestinians. It's, it's the scene definitely in the world, of course, with Palestinians, we have a unique context of occupation and colonial domination, uh, which I'm going to speak about in a minute. But I think uh, in the world in general, the health systems, uh, the collapsed health systems and their effects on specific communities that suffer from dis uh, discrimination and lack of justice are now very clear in the scene. Also, uh, the restraints on movement are affecting many, many of these communities uh, 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 economically and many of the workers of I'm going to also address that in my intervention. And also, I think um, the militarization of the space and, and the reaction of the governments to this, um, to this uh, pandemic and to, uh, in light of the emergency have escalated um, using militarization instead of health to react uh, for this uh, um, emergency. And as Adala, we worked exactly under this framework. We worked in issues of access to justice to Palestinians, but we also worked in issues of dignified life and the conditions that Palestinians are living in under Corona. And also we challenged uh, the, Israel's, uh, the Israeli government and the Israeli emergency system in general, um, uh, the reaction to the Corona and the restriction and limitations that were issued uh, through the emergency regulations and their effects on specific uh, uh, communities. And specifically we're speaking about uh, Palestinians inside Israel and in the OPT. Um, I'll start with the issue of uh, access to health. Um, since the beginning of the, uh, the uh, pandemic and the spread of the coronavirus uh, um, here, um, the Israeli government, we even had to start with the smallest, smallest details, such as the accessibility of the information to Palestinians. Uh, it took it took weeks um, um, after Adala's interventions and many other actors to basically translate these materials and, and, and spread the awareness among the community on how to protect uh, people can protect themselves and, uh, and how to, uh, um, to have more accessibility to health uh, uh, in that context. Um, and later on, when the spread started, we have started to witness that inside Israel among Palestinians and in East Jerusalem, um, the number of people who tested positive for Corona are very low. And we started to think why Palestinians who tested positive for Corona are between 1% to 2%, despite the fact that Palestinian citizens of Israel are 20% uh, uh, of the uh, population. And when we looked into the details, uh, we witnessed the fact that tests are not conducted, are not conducted at the same rate. The rates of testing among Palestinians was very, very, very late. And it took a lot of effort basically to raise uh, the number of testing now now month more than month after uh, the start of uh, of the spread of the coronavirus we're still speaking about 12 percent of the testing conducting among palestinian citizens of israel so even though all these efforts were put we're still speaking about a very low number of testing and i'm gonna come to East Jerusalem later i'm still speaking about palestinian citizens of israel uh, so when, what are we dealing with now during the corona? I'll start with uh, maybe speaking about what does public health mean? What does, what does health mean to Palestinians? It doesn't mean only access to health services in this period and protection uh, from the coronavirus. It also means the underlying conditions. We're speaking about a, a, a population that is suffering from high, high rates of poverty. We're speaking about 50 50% of Palestinians inside Israel are under the poverty rate. We're speaking about 70% of the children in Naqab in the south. Um, 
kids are under the poverty rate. We're speaking about conditions of chronic disease that are much higher among Palestinians because of the special conditions and, and, and the, long, uh, the long, long years of discrimination in access to health and in, in general in the conditions of living of Palestinians. Of course, the, all of this now makes Palestinians not only individuals under risk uh, after certain ages, uh, but also a community under risk and therefore a community that needs uh, much more um, attention uh, when addressing this uh, emergency. Um, we've dealt with uh, the lack of infrastructure, of health infrastructure, the total lack of it in Naqab among the unrecognized villages. We're speaking about even a level of uh, the absence of clinics in these villages. Um, we speak about 37 Palestinian unrecognized villages in Naqab. 80,000 people live in these villages and have um, no access to health inside their towns. Also the ambulances, the emergency services do not enter these villages. Um, in other places of uh, where Palestinian community lives inside Israel, and we're speaking about the triangle and the north, um, we, we, maybe you will have clinics, but for example, for in big, big uh, Palestinian cities, you don't have hospitals. Um, most of the Palestinians will have to go to hospitals in Israeli Jewish cities. Um, and, and, and therefore, you, you have uh, uh, big areas uh, with uh, a lot of Palestinians living there without actually access to um, uh, infrastructure of health hospitals, ambulances, and also good quality uh, uh, clinics. Um, we had to deal with that uh, during the coronavirus, and, and we're aware that you cannot come and solve all these uh, very uh, deep-rooted issues. And even the hospitals that you have in cities such as Nazareth and others are private hospitals that are not uh, ready to deal with the issue of uh, the pandemic. Um, now, in East Jerusalem, uh, we mainly dealt with the issue of um, the, the Shafat refugee camp and Kufr Aqabu uh, and the areas and the neighborhoods locked uh, behind the wall that are um, were annexed to uh, Jerusalem uh, by Israel. So they are under the control of Israel, but Israel is not providing health care uh, during the coronavirus or was not providing health care during the coronavirus in these places. Neither, as Suha said, they allowed the Palestinian Authority to provide health care in these uh, places. We're speaking about 150,000 Palestinians. Um, now, the situation in the ground after following Adala's petition and, and, and our intervention is that drive-through or drive-in stations were open uh, to testing uh, the population, but they were open very late. Um, and some of them are not even functioning well in Kufr Aqab, in, um, in Shafat, uh, the station is not functioning well. And the other way that people can get tested is through the clinics uh, that different health uh, supplier in Israel. But again, those only test those who pay uh, or, or, or are participants of their health, specific health insurance. So the many of the community is, is, re is uh, remaining uh, without proper testing. And especially in East Jerusalem, since the testing started late and, and, the, and the number of uh, people who are testing positive is raising, uh, we think that the way to address the pandemic now is conducting random testing to try to map the spread of the virus and not only waiting for people to come and ask uh, to be tested. Uh, I think this is also true for Palestinian uh, citizens of Israel because while Israel now is, is starting um, to go back a little bit slowly to normal life, um, the um, people who are testing positive to, for coronavirus in Palestinian uh, um, cities and villages inside Israel is raising. And therefore, uh, the pattern that we're seeing lately is trying to bring like back to normal among Israeli Jewish cities while starting to put more lockdown, especially during Ramadan in, on, uh, in Palestinian uh, villages and cities inside Israel. And I'm going to address that later in the Israeli reaction to the pandemic um, and to see why this is happening and why the reaction is taking uh, this uh, uh, um, shape. Um, the second issue I want to speak about, and I'm not going to enter into Gaza, I think Suha covered that. Um, we also dealt with a lot of cases related to Gaza, but maybe if there are questions, I'm going to be um, receiving questions more about Gaza. Um, 
for the issue of dignified life and, and economic conditions of Palestinians. So, um, yeah, I mean, the instructions of uh, the World Health Organization and governments around the world are for people to stay at home, to wash their hands, to try to keep social distancing. Um, but for Palestinians, for many Palestinians, for many people around the world, but for many Palestinians, this uh, these instructions are not something they can apply to, the, to, their, uh, to their life. Uh, many Palestinians, especially in Naqab, in, in East Jerusalem, in Shaqfat refugee camp, these cases that we dealt with, in Gaza, in the West Bank, and, and in many places, are living under conditions that are uh, an overcrowding uh, uh, conditions that people cannot simply uh, keep distance. And inside Israel, um, if we get again the example of Naqab, Israel is not giving solutions. So if you sick, you're sick uh, and you're tested positive, you will stay in your home, a very crowded home with the rest of the family members and uh, without a solution outside the home. Uh, this is also something we're seeing in East Jerusalem. The numbers of people who are testing positive is raising and most of them are hospitalized at home, while Israel gave solutions for um, a lot of the Israeli Jewish uh, 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 cities and, and, and communities uh, outside of their houses, even though the crowdness is less in these cities and towns. Um, if we speak about washing hands, we are speaking about uh, uh, safe access to water, which is a privilege for many Palestinians, something it's a luxury that many Palestinians don't have. Uh, in Naqab, you don't have free, uh, you don't have safe access to clean water, and also in Gaza and in and many, many uh, other places. Um, if I want to go to the economic uh, situation, I think um, yeah, I mean, a lot of Palestinians are saying if we're not going to suffer from Corona, and, and, and people are not gonna die from corona, they're probably gonna suffer from hunger and extreme poverty. Uh, again, I, I mean, the, the rates of poverty among Palestinians and the rates of unemployment are very high everywhere. Uh, Gaza, West Bank, inside Israel, in Naqab, in East Jerusalem. Uh, and now people are required uh, uh, to stay at home but without the safety network that allows them actually to stay home and feed themselves and feed their families. Um, inside Israel, we're speaking a family about families um, um, that mostly uh, the members who are working in the families work in the service sector, uh, and have small family businesses, not big businesses, uh, or, uh, or work without contracts uh, and, and, and get their salary sometimes in a daily uh, base. I think this is the situation also for the West Bank, for Gaza, uh, for East Jerusalem. And in this case, um, inside Israel, for example, many of the government's reaction to the pandemic and what it gives a safety uh, uh, to workers didn't fit the patterns of employment among Palestinians. So those who are registers, of course, now have no income. Small businesses, uh, many of them didn't get relief. If we look at the picture now in Ramadan, uh, every business is closed after 6 uh, p.m. During the day, it's overcrowded. Uh, it's a very important for, uh, period for many Palestinian small businesses. Uh, and instead of benefiting in this period and trying to apply safety instruction, Israel had decided to totally close these businesses. And now uh, um, uh, these businesses are collapsing while people are going to buy from neighbors in Israeli uh, Jewish cities. Um, if we are speaking about um, the reaction to, uh, of Israel to try to help local councils or local uh, municipalities, Israel has given um, um, a lot of budget to try to save um, many local councils from money that they use lost from local taxes from big business businesses. Now, this condition does not apply to many Palestinian villages and cities. And therefore, the share of Palestinians from this budget, again, we're speaking about 20% of the population inside Israel, is only 1.7% of these budget is, budgets. And, and we're speaking about one of the big employers of Palestinians uh, inside Israel. I can go on and on about the, uh, the economic condition, but I understand we don't have enough time. And again, I'll be happy to receive questions. The last thing I want to speak about is when you have a, a system of historical injustice, including in health, when you have no 
access to health or very little access to health among Palestinians, but in general, a collapsed health system. And you have a, a state that is an occupier and, 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 and apply colonial domination towards the citizens, but and also Palestinians uh, in the OPT. Um, uh, Israel's emergency system is heavily, heavily built on militarization. And you would imagine that during the coronavirus, Israel will react and apply an emergency that is health-based. But this is not what we saw in, in, during this pandemic. What we saw actually is that Israel basically applied many authorities, and I'm going to speak about it, and, 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 and to react to the pandemic and to lead the emergency action against the pandemic. And all, all are heavily militarized. And of course, since they are militarized, Palestinians are not part of them. And therefore, they will ignore the needs of Palestinians. Um, and in that, I'm going to go uh, deeply into um, a little bit uh, two cases. One is uh, the surveillance case, um, and the other one also um, is the use of emergency regulation through this period. But before that, uh, I'll give you an example on how this um, militarization plays uh, a role now um, and, and the, the, the security uh, emergency reaction. With Palestinian prisoners, and I'm not going to repeat what Soha said, you would imagine that the solutions are freeing prisoners, trying to make the overcrowdedness less, uh, caring for their health conditions, caring for their hygiene, uh, distancing at this period. But what we saw from Israel from the beginning of the pandemic is immediately deciding to cut the only two ways of Palestinian political prisoners um, uh, to be in touch and in contact with the outside world, which are families and lawyers. And we're speaking about an absolute prohibition of contact, uh, physical contact, but also through the phone, if you're a prisoner, you're allowed to call your lawyer all, only if you have a court. Now, many of these Palestinian political prisoners are already judged, they don't have courts, but the only way that we as human rights organization can know about their situation is basically through the lawyers. Um, and even if they have court, we've heard witnesses from lawyers of them calling the prisoners with the guards basically listening to the call. So basically, the prisoners are not free to report on their situation. Now, with the families, Israel has allowed only minors to contact their family once a two week. And we've seen that they're allowing um, Palestinian women political prisoners. But as Suha said, um, this, is, uh, this was banned and prohibited from three Palestinian political uh, women prisoners. Um, and in general, uh, Palestinian political prisoners had only two ways to contact their family, just to wish uh, Ramadan Karim, which is a one-time call, or if you have contacted um, uh, someone who tested positive, and all of this only after uh, the petition that we have submitted to the Supreme Court. So meanwhile, we still know a little, only little about the condition that Palestinian prisoners are living under. Now to the Shabak uh, case, and I'll try to end by that. Um, at the beginning of the uh, Israel's attempts to combat the coronavirus, they directly um, started using um, different. So the one who's leading the um, the combat of against the coronavirus is the National Security Council in Israel, which is a heavily and it's a militarized body and it's part of the military uh, inside uh, Israel. Of course, again, Palestinians are not part of that, um, and they and therefore their needs are totally uh, ignored. Now. Um, the government, the Israeli government had issued emergency regulation. According to this emergency regulation, the Shabak, which is the Israeli security service, secret security uh, agency, um, will be allowed to basically listen to the calls and collect data about uh, citizens uh, inside Israel if they are a uh, patient or if they were in touch with someone who tested positive. Now, this is the first time that the tools of the Shabak that were usually and historically applied um, against Palestinians, uh, speaking about pers political persecution um, and uh, basically surveillance applying to Palestinians, they will move to the Israeli civil space and now they're affecting uh, all the citizens. As Adala, we went to the Supreme Court against the, these regulations. The Supreme Court asked the state that the state uses laws in, instead of emergency regulations. 
Um, and later, uh, Israel have decided to use one article of the Shabbat law, which is uh, um, uh, basically trying to widen the interpretation of the law to allow it uh, to be used during a civilian uh, emergency. Now we've tackled the issue of authority and the issue of uh, interpretation of the law, but I think the most important thing to know about um, this case is that basically um, it is a matter of authority, of course, and it's an important question, but this case actually showed you that in Israel, whenever like, um, 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 there is an emergency, even if it's an, a health emergency, and even if there are alternative ways, um, the ultimate and, and, and the, um, the, the immediate reaction is a heavily securitized and militarized reaction. And therefore, um, in this case, using the Shabbat, we won the case. Um, um, and, and, and basically now the Israeli government had to find another solution if they need um, basically to use the Shabak and the court tried to limit it, to limit the interpretation of the specific article of the law, but still the court gave, and, and we criticize the decision of the court, the court gave authority to the state to use this article from the Shabak law to basically collect data and serve and, and, and uh, conduct surveillance against its own um, citizens. In this case, even if it's a narrow, for us, it's still extremely um, a concerning issue. Um, I'll, um, I'll go just um, in a ve very, very quickly. Um, through, Yanni, we spoke about access to health, dignified life of Palestinian, militarization of the reaction uh, of uh, the Israeli government to the pandemic. But it's also important to note that oppression against Palestinian people is still continuous in, in many of the ways that we already um, know from before uh, this uh, pandemic. And, and even though, and Israel and the Israeli government is using the focus on the pandemic to basically pass many policies that are um, targeting Palestinians. So Israel, um, the Israeli um, uh, government and, and, and the Likud and Blue White has signed um, um, a coalition agreement for a national um, uh, emergency uh, government. And you would think that this government would come and deal with the pandemic. And this is actually part of why this government was established. And many of the decisions related to the work of this government were announced in the agreement for after um, uh, um, deciding on the composition of the government and the principles of the government. One or uh, two issues were excluded from that condition. One of them is annexation. Uh, this is the only thing that was excluded and was decided on, despite the fact that the government was not composed and that they didn't decide on the principles of the government. And they say that um, um, uh, they will start basically legalizing annexation in July. And this shows us exactly how there is a full Israeli consensus, regardless of all the differences between uh, the two parties when it comes to violating Palestinian rights. Um, this is uh, for now. I hope I, I, I managed to cover many of the issues. There's still many issues I didn't manage to cover and I'll be happy to receive any questions in this regard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zahir. Um... That was really informative. And now we're gonna go into um, the question and answer portion of the event. So I have a couple questions that I'd like to ask both of you. Um, first, I wanna start with Suha. This is actually a question that uh, many of our audience members have asked. And so um, could you tell us a little bit more about your mother's case? And for those in the audience who don't know, um, who your mother is, if you could just sort of explain about her situation and any updates you have on her case, because people are really interested in that. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you, Suhair, for this amazing presentation. It was really, really informative, very comprehensive. Uh, and thank you also for the question. Um, uh, definitely. So my mother is a parliamentarian, uh, an elected parliamentarian, um, and she has been uh, the subject of waves of attacks, systematic attacks uh, since 2014, actually. Um, she received um, 
an expulsion order to remove her from her home to the city of Jericho. She protested that order. She did not comply. Um, and as a result, she was arrested uh, later uh, in 2015. She spent uh, 15 months uh, uh, in Israeli prisons um, and then she she was released and then she was rearrested less than a year after that in 2017 again. She spent 20 months then under administrative detention, which is without trial or um, uh, um, without trial or charges. After 20 months of administrative detention, she was released for uh, no longer than um, eight months actually. And then she was rearrested again in October of 2019. She is still under trial. And I say that in air quotes because Israel does not have a legitimate legal system or legal process. Um, and uh, of course, since the um, um, since the lockdown or the outbreak of the coronavirus, uh, all uh, lawyers' visitations and family visits have been suspended since then. Um, she is uh, currently uh, um, scheduled to have a hearing on May 11th. We have no idea how this is going to um, play out because the last session that was um, that was scheduled for March was postponed uh, until May 11th. There's a, um, a very high chance that this session will also or hearing will also be postponed. Um, and these hearings, just to clarify that um, they are not really legitimate um, legal proceedings. Um, and it's really a kangaroo system. If you look at the statistics, um, by uh, the, media, the latest statistics was that 97.7% of Palestinians who are arrested are convicted. Um, and this is, uh, this is, this shows that Israel obviously does not carry out uh, legitimate legal um, or does not um, have a legitimate legal system that it follows. Uh, also, not to mention, as Tuhir mentioned, um, um, not to forget, sorry, that these are military courts. The judge, the prosecution are also, mili also all military personnel. Um, in the situation of my mother, actually, it has been very, very stressful on a personal level, to be honest, because for the past month, we have been on our toes just waiting for that phone call, also coordinating with my family in order to be in the same space at the same time all the time in order to receive that 10-minute phone call just to know what the situation is like. And uh, my mother also suffers from chronic illnesses and diseases, and uh, she is definitely more vulnerable and susceptible to um, catching the coronavirus. And this has been extremely, extremely stressful, not just for us as a family, for all families of uh, Palestinian detainees. This is the current uh, situation and we, um, we have no idea how long this is going to um, uh, or how for how long the 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 sessions are going to uh, keep getting postponed, um, and eventually, if there's going to be a conviction and eventually, obviously, a, a sentence. Um, and within the the again within the context of the current uh, situation, uh, especially in women prisons, because there ha there are no um, cell phones, there are no landlines, um, all visitations are suspended. It's, it's, it's extremely, extremely uh, distressing um, and um, concerning for the families not knowing actually or having any updates. Uh, my mother has, was also recently prevented from um, speaking to her lawyer um, and the, um, the, the prison administration actually um, claimed that the lawyer has to submit uh, or has to submit basically um, um, or ask for permission uh, to coordinate this phone call. Um, she has not yet uh, she uh, been able to actually contact her lawyers. lawyers. Um, and, and again, the situation in prisons in general, they were overcrowded. The last thing that we heard from somebody, from a woman who was recently released, and my mother kind of gave her a verbal message to tell her to tell us that she is okay. Uh, the the only um, thing that she mentions in terms of 
uh, sanit um, sanitizing material is chlorine. And uh, chlorine is extremely toxic and the overuse of chlorine as a cleaning product is definitely not uh, good also for the re uh, respiratory system, especially for people who already have complications with that. So this is kind of just an overall um, overview of her situation. Of course, the basis of her arrest is her publicly uh, speaking against the occupation. Uh, so uh, uh, she is a human rights defender and this is, this is the basis of her uh, continuous detention and targeting by Israel. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Um, circling back to something that you kind of talked about in your report, um, can you talk about if there are any ways specifically that the Israeli government is using the cover of this, of this pandemic and crisis specifically to advance their goals of annexation and how those annexation efforts are affecting the lives of Palestinians living in Area C um, and places like the Jordan Valley? Oh, so you're on mute, so we can't hear you. Sorry, I just said I, I lost you after Area C. Was there a second part of the question? Yeah, just how it's affecting people in living in places like Area C and the Jordan Valley and these places that are specifically slated for annexation. Right. Um, actually, Israel does not spare any situation in order to push its agenda and its um, overall goal of permanently annexing the land. Uh, and as seen recently, and as mentioned by Suhair as well, uh, Israel's annexationist policies are alive and well, and they have continued. Um, in terms of Area C, in, in particular, the annexation of the Jordan Valley, and this was part also of the um, uh, Trump's peace plan or uh, um, what was proposed. Um, Israel is obviously, this shows Israel's priorities. The fact that the annexationist policies are continuing, um, even under the current state of emergency, only speaks for Israel's priorities and overall policy of, of um, uh, forcible transfer and permanent annexation. Um, of Palestinian land. Now, the situation for people in Area C, um, um, people in Area C already experienced all of these um, uh, shortcomings of Israel's measures and policies, discriminatory measures and policies in the area. And um, Israel has long created a coercive environment uh, for people living in Area C in order to push them out and to forcibly transfer them. Um, and this is something that has been systematically happening anyway. Now, um, with the continuation of, of the annexation uh, uh, policy that Israel has been uh, carrying out, definitely we, we do not know, especially in the Jordan Valley, for example, what is going to happen to almost 50,000 people who are uh, residing in the area. And, um, and this is something that has been um, not just within the context of COVID-19, but has been systematically um, um, or has been a systematic policy carried out by people. I saw an interesting by Israel. Sorry, I saw an interesting question in the thread here about also um, farmers, because in a lot of areas, see, especially in the Jordan Valley area, which is very resource rich, this is people's main source of livelihood. Uh, so access to land has also been long um, undermined and, and, and prevented by Israel, um, whereas Israeli settlers have regular access to vast areas of fertile land in order to keep their um, um, ways of or, or uh, uh, means of subsistence and, and uh, livelihood. Um, so attacks on herders and farmers are also have, have long been systematic attacks attacks by settlers and harassments by the Israeli occupying forces, and also seizing land through declaring land as military areas, um, firing zones, um, and um, uh, um, the general um, uh, policies, including uh, regular demolitions of homes of any structures, have made life for Palestinians in Area C unlivable. Now, the continuation of uh, the annexation of, of, of the Jordan Valley only means that Israel actually um, not only um, uh, um, is not 
considering the state of emergency, but it's actually using the state of emergency in order to continue with this annexation of policies. Thank you so much. I want to now switch back to Sahar for a second. Um, Sahar, you mentioned in your report that Israel is slowly easing restrictions on um, the country, particularly in majority Jewish towns and cities. And you mentioned that they're subs at the same time actually enforcing more of a lockdown on Palestinian areas. Could you expand more on this? Um, why is that so? And sort of what does that actually look like on the ground? Um, thank you, Yumna. Um, um, I think what happens now is basically that Israel's reaction health-wise, uh, speaking about testing and, and the availability of um, um, health care, but also protection measures uh, for the Palestinian community inside Israel uh, and Palestinians in East Jerusalem uh, has came only late, very late. And until now, we're still speaking again about lower, much lower rates of testing. Uh, I, as I said, uh, only 12% uh, of the testing um, that is happening is happening in the Palestinian community. At the beginning, we, speak, we were speaking about much, much uh, low percentages. Uh, and now we're starting to see uh, a race on the Palestinians who are testing positive. Now, Israel is not allowing, like not providing protection measure. And I'll give you an example. In East Jerusalem, as, and I think I mentioned that in my report, the majority of people are uh, who tested positive and they are in their homes. This is also similar um, to the situation in Naqab, where Israel is not allowing the creation of permanent uh, buildings inside the unrecognized villages, basically to allow people to enter into isolation. Um, away from the families. Uh, and why is that? Again, you go back to the original reason. When you want uh, and you when you have a lot of, of plans to force displace uh, these 80,000 people, Israel does not now want to put uh, 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 um, temporary buildings because they are afraid that they will serve um, the resilience of the population, that the population actually will use in the state. The same reason why you don't have clinics, health clinics in Naqab, because this is, as Suha said, part of the course of environment that Israel is creating in these areas. And it's not only measured by the action, the direct action of forced displacement, but also uh, it's measured by the conditions that um, the social and economic condition that uh, people are living under uh, in this area. Um, now for the majority of Palestinians, since you started the tested earlier, and not only the testing, but also the awareness, the raising awareness earlier among, among uh, the Jewish population, now you have lower rates of uh, people who are testing positive, while you have much higher among the Palestinian society. So Israel has decided to ease the uh, restraints, while its reaction to uh, raising uh, the raising um, uh, numbers of people who are testing positive among the Palestinian uh, community was a reaction of, okay, let's use the lockdown as the first resort. Now, when you have a population um, that of course is under health, uh, uh, health risk, and we're very extremely concerned to the communities that we serve, um, but we're also aware of the economic uh, conditions that this community lived under, and we're aware that the Israeli government's, government's measure left many, many families uh, without actually an income that will um, have access to the basic needs, food, and the, especially in Ramadan, when people um, 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 usually spend more money on um, in this month uh, on food and in other supplies. Now, instead of providing more testing, providing more access to health, providing more means of protection through isolation and other means, and raising more awareness, Israel had took the easiest path, which is applying a lockdown uh, from every day from 6 uh, p.m. until 3 a.m. So through this lockdown, lockdown, the shops and the small businesses and everything that serves the community have to be closed totally. Now, what happened? What happened is actually that Israel has continued um, to use the workforce of the Palestinian citizen villages who leave every morning and go to work on Israeli cities and towns 
because this is actually also how the space is designed. Palestinians don't have access to industrial areas in their uh, villages and towns. The farms and the, the farmers, uh, many of the lands are, 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 were taken from Palestinians. So most of the Palestinian work outside their villages and towns. So they go to work, they come back, um, more crowd is, is creating when the workers are come, da, come back and want to buy their supplies. A lot of uh, crowdness is, is happening during the day in Palestinian businesses. And later when people have iftar and want to go and buy many of their supplies, they will have to go and buy from big Israeli businesses outside their villages. And now you have a situation while Palestinian businesses are collapsing, many of these big Israeli supermarket and businesses can Yani, have more chances to be flourishing on uh, Palestinian customers. So you don't have enough and, and, and um, help, um, uh, um, providing help, which is what's actually needed, while you're having more um, conditions by the, and, and, and instructions by the Israeli government that are contributing to the worsening of the uh, of the uh, situation, the economic situation. To add another layer in that, when you send police and you're speaking all the time about sending military into Palestinian villages, this is not something neutral for Palestinians. Uh, in general, yani, militarization is something that um, we as human rights organizations don't want to see. But in the context of Palestinians, military and police have a different relationship with the community. Uh, the com Palestinian community is viewed as an enemy. And therefore, when you send military instead of health, of course, you can expect what um, the results are, are, are going to be. Um, so I think um, just to summarize in this regard, um, what's going on now is just a continued, a continuous um, um, situation of, again, discrimination, extreme discrimination and injustice in, in the terms of access to health and access to economic relief uh, for people, why militarization and lockdown uh, is being in the front. Uh, and the way uh, we think about it is that, and this is happening again in other parts of the world, but here is happening in a very unique and specific way, is that a specific community start, you know, the state starts to view a specific community as the source of the pandemic, as the source of uh, infection and not being accountable and not um, uh, um, questioning basically the infrastructure and the underlying condition that led to this situation. So our worst scenario, our nightmare is that our community is going to be uh, um, communities in the West Bank, in Gaza, inside Israel are going and in East Jerusalem, of course, are going to be communities with high rates of uh, 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 people who are getting sick. And, and, and under lockdown, militarized lockdown, why Israel is going back to normal and basically forgetting about us, which is um, what what yeah, I mean, the most natural thing to have under the Israeli colonial domination uh, um, and the way it, we know it works. Thank you so much. This is a question for both of you. Both of you touched on sort of the lack of accountability for the Israeli violations and actions both inside Israel and as well as in the occupied territory. So, you know, Adala and al haq you're both advocacy and human rights organizations. So. You know, my question, and I think it's something that maybe a lot of people watching this also might be thinking is sort of in theory, what should be the role of the international community in these in an event like this? And in reality, what has their response been, if any? So I'd like to open that question up to, to both Suha and Suhair. Um, I'll start. Uh, so how you can start, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just gonna ask, go ahead. Um, I think again, uh, to, to go back to the way me and Suha both opened, again, what we're seeing is uh, a scene that all the injustices and violations are just intensifying. This is something that we've been pointing out as human rights organization to the international community years over years. We've been speaking about uh, the social economic rights of Palestinians. We've been speaking about uh, violations of the rights in terms of oppression and, and, and annexation, which happened in this period. We've been speaking about militarization uh, in the case that I forgot to mention them in the previous. We've been speaking about their conditions for years. Now, this is a clear picture and, and uh, of what we already know. 
know. Um, the problem is that, um, and this is a dilemma also that we are facing, is that now you have to deal with statements from the UN specifically on Palestinian uh, prisoners. Um, but I think um, since Israel for years has not been accountable for its uh, uh, violation and its crimes, um, which are now turning into a real life threat uh, to Palestinians and also economic threat and uh, to many Palestinian families, um, I think, um, um, yani, of course, yani, the question of accountability is the most relevant question now because this is the only way um, that as Palestinians we secure the non repentance of this uh, that this these violations are not going to be repeated and as Israel continues not to comply with um, uh, the international resolutions and the international recommendation or all the international um, decision and international law in general um, there is no security for any Palestinians um, Palestinians who are in Gaza who are under the blockade you cannot only address now um, the, um, um, the health system in Gaza that will provide treatment for people. You have to address the question of the blockage. You have to address the question of uh, years of war that actually led to the destruction of the health uh, system. In Naqab, you cannot just come and address uh, putting a temporary uh, places uh, for isolation or uh, provide health care. You have to address the issue of non-recognition, the issue of forced displacement. In East Jerusalem, you're not only putting a drive-in here or there, you have to address the fact that Israel annexed East Jerusalem and put this population under the uh, apartheid wall and therefore isolated them from the city and banned them to get relief from the Palestinian Authority, but also didn't supply them with their needs. So all of what we're seeing now is a result of years of Israel uh, being um, basically not being accountable for its violations. And what we expect now as Palestinians, and we know that uh, the world is facing these tough times and of course there are all over the world a lot of violation what we expect now is from the international community of course to address the most urgent needs of the population but also to address the root causes of that and the root causes of that is an israeli system of domination dominating not only palestinians living un under occupation but also all Palestinian, Palestinian citizens of Israel in the 67 occupied territories and Palestinian refugees. And let us not forget about those who are also now suffering the consequences of Corona, living in refugee camps, living without safety, living in overcrowdedness and suffering uh, um, from the outcomes of this uh, pandemics. Um, so I guess that's what we're trying to achieve, both giving the balance of um, having uh, immediate relief, but also addressing the root causes. Um, actually, what I what I have to say is very similar to what Sohir has just highlighted. Most of the responses that we have seen from the international community have been humanitarian responses. And while humanitarian needs are uh, absolutely necessary, there's a huge problem with depoliticizing the situation at this stage. Um, so the root causes and the underlying uh, determinants of um, and the um, of the occupation and, and its uh, measures and its policies. Um, given those, any real response to, to COVID-19 uh, would be one that addresses these root causes and uh, underlining determinants that are perpetuating violations against Palestinians and pushing uh, for permanent annexation again of occupied territory and for sustaining a system of racial discrimination and apartheid. So um, of course, in, and this has been um, a problem um, 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 a historic problem that there's definitely not enough intervention and that's only a reflection of the culture of impunity here um, and um, um, impunity in terms of um, uh, sorry it also exemplifies kind of impunity um, um, for uh, the Israeli occupying forces and its and its practices. The COVID-19 crisis is a political one worldwide, but it's specifically in situations of occupation and apartheid. And this depoliticization or a politicized approach to intervention is only um, um, kind of 
uh, drifting the attention away from the uh, underlying uh, and root causes um, and the primary role of uh, the systematic um, and deliberate uh, uh, continuation of human rights violations um, and also within the context of COVID-19. So um, again, this is just echoing what Suhair uh, has said um, and this is basically, uh, again, just a reflection of the culture of impunity and years and years of uh, failing to hold Israel accountable to its uh, violations of human rights on a, on a regular and continuous basis, even uh, in the case of a global emergency. That's great. Um, thank you so much. Um, this is also another question that perhaps both of you could respond to is, um, this is a question from our audience is, has COVID impacted security coordination between the PA and Israel? Um, and sort of how are the governments cooperating during this period? I mean, as you both mentioned, we saw um, what happened with the case of Palestinian laborers, this effort that was a supposed coordination between you know, the Palestinian Authority in Israel, but was almost immediately undermined by Israel and Israeli authorities. So how has the security coordination specifically and just cooperation between the governments been affected during this time, if at all? Um, my comment on that is that the security coordination has continued as, as it has before, which we um, uh, often speak against, um, but it only continued when it, it is for the benefit of the occupying power, right? And this is exemplified in, in, in the examples that we have given, including the, in the situation of, um, uh, of the workers. And in that case, the coordination wouldn't necessarily fall under a definition of security coordination more or it would fall under um, um, a, a type of coordination that is, uh, I guess, a different type of coordination um, under a unique and unprecedented um, state of emergency at this point. Um, but the security coordination has surely continued. Um, and um, this is, um, um, I mean, just one example of that is the continuation of arresting people uh, in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem. And this happens in coordination with the Palestinian Authority. Now, um, the, the security coordination, again, this wouldn't fall even under security coordination, but it's only um, given the, the situation of workers here and how Israel uh, is not only uh, not willing to coordinate with the Palestinian Authority when it's necessary to ensure the safety uh, of Palestinians, um, but it's also very selective when it comes to its coordination um, uh, arguments, I guess, or its um, uh, um, praising coordination and kind of pushing for coordination and kind of painting this illusion of uh, coexistence in, 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 uh, in peace um, and what security coordination could possibly imply in situation of occupation. Thank you. Sahar, did you have uh, anything to say about yeah, that? Yeah, I'll add very quick. I think Soha covered most of it, but I'll say that uh, from our perspective, um, we're not speaking about coordination between government. We're speaking about an occupier and this occupier is controlling uh, all the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem and, and, and Gaza. Uh, and therefore, of course, the coordination is continuous, but as Suha said, it's continuing in a way of an occupier, of, a, of the, this uh, actor who actually have the full control and therefore uses coordination for its own benefit. And so I gave the example um, of, of, of arrests. And in the case of workers, we saw that there was a lot of coordination at the beginning. Palestinian workers are working in Israel from the beginning with full coordination, not only through this period, uh, but we saw that the coordination didn't address, of course, their condition. People were banned from going back to their family. And eventually, when Israel wanted to get rid of them, when those got uh, some of them got uh, sick, they basically took them and threw them without any coordination with the uh, Palestinian Authority. Um, and, and, and you keep, uh, and, and we, we saw that uh, also in Jerusalem. Uh, so um, Israel, uh, the Palestinian Authority tried to intervene in Kufur Aqab, 
Uh, but then Israel banned the Palestinian Authority to keep control, why again, it's not providing what it's supposed to provide for the community, but still asserting that this is a territory that was annexed uh, to Israel and therefore uh, under control. And we saw the coordination, of course, at the beginning when Israel decided um, and basically the, the, the Palestinian Authority announced lockdown in areas such as Beit Lahem and Beit Jala and later lockdown in the Old West Bank. Of course, Israel was part of applying this uh, lockdown. Um, just above, to go back to the case of workers, so why would Israel uh, coordinate? in the issue of workers, not only when they were sick, um, they were thrown, but even from the beginning to start with the decision to raise the number of permits of workers who are sleeping inside Israel. Uh, so Israel did that and announced the field of construction and other fields are as essential because of uh, the benefits to the Israeli economy. You're speaking about a benefit of, um, uh, you're speaking about 66% percent of the incomes in the Israeli construction uh, um, uh, field uh, economically are coming from uh, the benefit of having Palestinian uh, workers work in Israel as a cheap labor, where they have no um, uh, basic conditions and, and, and nothing of co their conditions and the protection was coordinated. These, uh, these workers were banned from going to their families for one month or two months. They work there without any health insurance, without any safety. The only coordination is regarding regarding entering and leaving. And therefore, it's not a coordination between two governments that one government tries to ensure the rights of its uh, own residents or citizens or whatever. You're still speaking about a situation of occupation, of colonial domination, uh, where every coordination that Israel does is to serve its own security or economic uh, or other interests. Um, and in that sense, of course, it's continuing. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions from our audience that I find really interesting that Zuhair, I think you would be able to answer is, do you see any change of perception or the treatment of Palestinians living in Israel for the better in light that many of frontline health professionals in Israel are Palestinian? Or has, or has it actually gone for the worse or how has that been affected at all? I don't think so. I, I'm not a believer in this um, discourse of present representation. Palestinian healthcare workers have always been uh, in the, um, working in uh, inside Israel and providing healthcare uh, absolutely to all citizens. Um, but I think this is not a measure of the population um, the conditions. Uh, Palestinian healthcare professionals were for years being discriminated against and they were attacked and they were faced with racial discrimination discrimination related from the Israeli government, but also from the Israeli population. The way we measure discrimination and condition of a population is through seeing what is the condition of the overall population. And I think I went very, very deeply in that. And I think any slogan of, oh, we have a lot of Palestinian doctors, we have, it's, it's, it reminds me of um, um, the very, um, yeah, I mean, on the surface analysis of a condition of community, uh, you have representative in the Knesset, you have this number of teachers, you have uh, teachers, you have this numbers of working in Israeli uh, governmental uh, authorities or, or ministries. I don't think this is how you measure discrimination. I don't think you, this is how you measure injustice. Palestinian citizens of Israel since 48 are, are put under uh, a system of institutionalized racial discriminations, years of injustice, and years of forced displacement and home demolitions. And this absolutely didn't, uh, uh, didn't and is not going to uh, stop in the future. Some of the, of, of, um, of the actions taken by Israel and the policies has been freezed, uh, but in, in no way Israel has announced uh, any um, any improvements of the of the conditions of Palestine and and it cannot announce that because until Israel dismantle uh, its racial discriminatory system and I'm not speaking about this government or that government but the very deep system of discrimination we're speaking about uh, 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 tens of uh, laws that discriminate against Palestinians. The last one is the Jewish nation state basic law, which basically Israel has announced in its constitution that. Uh, uh, Jews are superiors according to the a basic law, while all Palestinians are inferiors regarding of 
uh, a citizenship or residency or being under occupation um, in that regard. And it's also in this law announced that the state of Israel um, uh, is a state for Jewish people only who have and, and only them have the right to self-determination in it. And it's in the land of Israel. So again, you have a complete system of racial domination of supremacy for Jews in all historic Palestine and all Palestinians are inferior, including Palestinian citizens. And this, no doctor, no nurse, no one, and uh, no, you know, no number and percentage of representation of Palestinians in the health uh, care providers will solve these very, very um, deep uh, root uh, issues. Thank you so much. I think that's a really important point. Before we pass it off to Dave and before we wrap up, um, I just wanted to ask both of you for some brief, you know, final thoughts. Um, and something that maybe you feel that our audience must you know, really pay attention to or that they must know um, before before we wrap up. So feel free to, I guess we can start with, um, we can start with Suha and then Zuhair. Sure. Uh, thank you, Yumna, and thank you. Uh, Suha, you're on mute again. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, Again, I think just going back to um, the point of um, paying attention not to depoliticize the situation right now is, is, is really important because it's not just an issue of dealing with a current uh, health, uh, state of emergency and then going back to a state that um, uh, or going back to where we were uh, previously. And this is something that is um, very important um, to, to keep in mind because this is not, um, we're talking about human rights violations in the context of COVID-19 that are coming to light because this is a global concern and it's a global health emergency. And this is a situation where uh, everybody in the, in, I, I would guess in the international community would identify with if we talk about specific violations in relation to COVID-19, and this becomes more relevant to the international community, but let, let's not forget that the international community and third state parties also have legal obligations in order to hold Israel accountable its human rights violation to its illegal occupation of the occupied territory and its illegal annexation. It's also, um, um, th this Al-Haq also is, is um, and our department is a legal research department, so it's also important to recall that uh, Israel has obligations under the Fourth Geneva Con Convention. There are responsibilities uh, that are specific to health, um, um, Israel as the occupying power has obligations again, uh, for example, under Article 56, these obliga obligations are specific to situations where uh, there are possible pandemics and epidemics and uh, contagious diseases. Um, so it has the duty to ensure cooperation with the national authorities, uh, but in relation to uh, medical and hospital establishments and services, so basically ensuring the safety um, of, of of the occupied uh, population and ensure, ensuring uh, rights that are relevant to public health and hygiene and sanitation. Uh, but there are also other um, there are also other obligations also um, under international hum uh, human rights law uh, in the occupied territory, specifically um, under the uh, International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, particularly Article 12.1, uh, where Israel is obligated to ensure the rise to the highest attainable standard of health of everybody within its territory uh, or subject to its jurisdiction that includes Palestinians on both sides of the green line and must be um, ensured without discrimination as well. So when we talk about the rights to health and the rights that are um, that have to be uh, sustained or have to be protected by the occupying power in this regard, we're not just talking about rights that are related to health, we're also talking about other rights that are relevant to ensuring the highest attainable standard of living, including the right to water and sanitation, including the right to housing. Um, so this is kind of um, just to wrap up and say that all of these issues are um, inherently interconnected and it's really important to keep that in mind. 
Thank you. So um, here, some final thoughts. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll try to be very quick. Again, I'll, 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 I'll close the way I opened. This is a global pandemic, and it's true that the virus doesn't distinguish between people based on race or gender or uh, a, a national belonging. But the conditions uh, that many communities around the world are under, uh, the, 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 the years of, uh, of injustice and, and discrimination are now coming into um, the, the very terrifying scene that we're seeing. And in Palestine, uh, when you have years of um, not only occupation, years of, again, racial and colonial domination uh, uh, targeted towards all Palestinians since 48, Palestinians under the occupation of 67, but also Palestinians, citizens of Israel and Palestinian refugees, you will see uh, all um, 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 the, the, the intensified scene of injustice um, and oppression um, um, in healthcare and economically, but also in um, the continuity of Israel's violation, the way me and Suha describe it through this uh, um, webinar. And, and also you will see the emergency reaction of Israel and the way it's um, escalating uh, the violations. And just to remind you, when we speak, me and Suha, about deep uh, root causes uh, that Palestinians live and now come into uh, this horrific reality. In emergency, Palestinians are living under emergency rule since 48. Israel announced uh, emergency since the day it's, uh, of its establishment. And now all the emergency system, all the emergency reaction is basically, again, militarized and using many of the tools that it used in the past to target Palestinians, that, such as using the Shabak, the, uh, the intelligence um, uh, security uh, service. Um, and again, this is all possible. And Israel is also able to pass annexation through a coalition agreement without people even noticing it's because of the culture of impunity, because Israel for years has not been accountable for the violations and crimes that were committing, committed against all Palestinians again. And if we want to solve um, what, to solve the problems that we're faced with during the corona, this is not possible if we keep addressing them, as Suha said, in a humanitarian uh, uh, perspective, or in, again, uh, using the same tools that were used again and again. And we saw how humanitarian reaction to the crisis of Gaza without addressing the root causes of the blockade and other has affected the, the Gazan community and has made Israel continue its violation. And I think this is true for all Palestinians. So the answer here, of course, is a reaction an immediate reaction to what's going on now during the pandemic, but what we need to see and what we want to see as Palestinian, as human rights defenders, is a real accountability that will not keep our community, our communities, the Palestinian communities, fragile in the future under any emergency, with it um, be war or violation, but also health emergency, as in this case. Thank you. Thank you, Suhair and Suha. Um, those were really amazing reports and extremely informative for everybody. Um, I know our audience has given an amazing feedback. Um, so I'm gonna pass it off now to Dave, who is going to wrap this up for us. All right, super. Well, yeah, we're gonna wrap up now, folks. We wanna thank you all again for joining us. We wanna thank Sohair Abbas from Adala and Suha Jarar from Al Haq for partnering with us on this program. We hope to hear from both of you again uh, in the coming weeks. For those who are new to us, Mondo Weiss is an independent nonprofit news and analysis publication from a left progressive perspective on the Israeli occupation and its impact on US politics. Uh, we're funded by readers. And if you found this program useful to understanding what Palestinians are facing right now in this crisis, please make a donation. It will help us offer more programming like this in the upcoming weeks as we continue to cover this. Uh, you can donate securely online by visiting our site at mondoweiss.net slash donate. And a portion of the donations will go to Adala and Al Haq uh, to support their work. Every little bit helps and we appreciate your support. Everyone stay safe. Thanks again for joining us and, uh, and we'll be back again in the next uh, few weeks. Bye. Thank you all.